Morning, Pansy Chapel. I got one good morning in here. <laughs> Amen. Good morning, Pansy Chapel. Man, God is good. God is good. Oh, I've just uh, already been so blessed this morning. I want to welcome everybody who's watching, and uh, let's just seek the Lord this morning. Let's open our hearts to Him, and uh, can, uh, I would just love to start off by just asking Him to speak and coming to fill me and anoint the Word that I feel that He's given me this morning. And uh, so join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, oh, you are so good. And you are worthy of praise. And there is no other name that is worthy of our praise and our worship this morning except the name of Jesus, the name of Yahweh, King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, we worship you this morning. We thank you so much for your faithfulness in our lives. We thank you so much for the life of the Holy Spirit that goes with us and never leaves us nor forsakes us. Father, I want to just give you this time and I want to give you my voice and I want to pray and ask Lord Jesus that you would please come and fill me with your spirit to speak truth and life this morning. I want to pray, Lord Jesus, that you would please anoint the word in the hearts and minds of every listener. And Father, I ask that you would please set up guardrails in our hearts this morning, that we would discern truth, that your Spirit would reveal truth to us, Lord. I would pray and ask, Jesus, that you would awaken truth in us today. And I pray that, that the fruit that comes from this lesson, Lord, would be that we would have a fresh zeal to know you, to walk in victory, to walk in power. Father, I pray that you would stir within us this morning and that you would speak to us and breathe new life into our hearts. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. And I do also want to pray that you would, in your mighty power, thwart all plans of the enemy that has been sent against this place this morning into our living rooms this morning, those plans that have been sent to steal, kill, and destroy. I declare them null and void in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit and the truth of your word would flow this morning and that it would be unhindered this day as we worship you and look into your word. I thank you so much for your word, Father, this morning and pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I feel this morning that God has given me a word to stir us up, and uh, I'm excited about that. And I just got to start off by, by saying, and this is really going to make Delan look really good, because last Sunday, he uh, started off the message by saying that the Lord had given him this song that he was on his spirit as he woke up. And it was a bit abnormal and a bit unusual for him to have, have a hymn. And so I, I really think what he was really doing was just trying to get brownie points with Dennis Brown and Corny Sawatsky. But that's beside. I'll leave that between him and the Lord. And, and so he had this song, this, when the role is called up yonder, and I'm sure that Corny and Dennis were smiling ear to ear. I'm sure there was many of you others here that thought that was fantastic. And, uh, and honestly, for me this week, I had a bit of an unusual experience as well. But I am going to get no brownie points when I share with you the the song that was on my heart as I was thinking and meditating about this word, and specifically for Corny and Dennis, I'm going to be lucky if they don't toss me out of the church and off the elder board, and, uh, but, but the song that was on my heart as I was meditating about this was, was not a Gaither song, it was not a hymn, and, and to be completely honest, it was not even a Christian song, it was the song Enter Sandman by Metallica. And I apologize if that offends people, but that is the song that was on my heart as I thought about this, and I, I, I realize I am now wearing officially the black sheep label of the elder board, and that's okay, you're going to have to deal with that. But, but in all seriousness, what I want to talk about this morning is heaviness. It feels to me like the opening lines of that Metallica song describe what many of us in our society and in our world are feeling over our lives. The, the, the first two lines simply say, exit light and enter night. Exit light and enter night. And it just felt to me, it just occurred to me, like that is exactly what many of us feel like is going on. It feels like there is this heaviness over us that we can almost, that we can almost feel physically. That we, can, that we can almost touch, and it weighs on us. Heaviness that, that is manifesting in our lives like discouragement, despair, anxiety, 
Depression, loneliness for sure, and hopelessness. And, I, and, I've, and I, I've talked to so many people in the last even few months that have expressed to me that there is just this heavy, and I feel it too. I have sometimes felt like, like it's just almost a crushing weight, and I want to speak to that this morning. And in addition to that, I find that I'm amazed how busy it still feels like we are. It feels like our calendars have been emptied from so many things. It feels like we should have lots of time on our hands, and yet it feels like we are just busy. And I sometimes wonder, is it because we are so busy trying to fight all these feelings of discouragement and despair and hopelessness and all these things? Are we, are we so focused on trying to just survive, just get through, that it, that it feels like there's just this cycle of heaviness and busyness that we're on, and it just almost seems inescapable? And along with that, there's, I wonder, are we just kind of trying to medicate that heaviness and medicate how we feel with just with things like extra movies and, and watching maybe more news going on social media, those kinds of things? Are we just trying to fill that time with other empty things instead of seeking the one who could really break through and deliver us from that heaviness? And so this morning, I want to talk about that there is hope in the middle of heaviness. And so I want to kind of break those two down. I want to first address the heaviness, and then we're going to talk about the hope. But the first thing we're looking at here is, is, is heaviness. And when I think about heaviness, I know, I, I believe I have used this illustration before, but it is so powerful that I just feel that I will use it again. For those of you who have, who have watched the movie The Hobbit, uh, it, there is this scene in The Hobbit where, where Gandalf has broken into this enemy tower of Dol Guldur, and he is trying to get an old dwarf king out of their train, and, and he's trying to rescue him from the clutches of evil. And, and in that scene, it looks like they're, they're going to get crushed by the enemy and, uh, and those kind of the, the Azog and the other guys are all around them and it looks like they're going to be for sure killed and captured and then Gandalf pulls off one of his cool tricks and they're getting out and it looks like for a, for a moment they're going to make it. They're, they're, they're heading for the exit and they're going to make it and all of a sudden they run face to face with, the, with the, kind of the prince of the evil in the movie, King Sauron, and they're faced with this and, and Gandalf holds up his... his his staff or whatever you want to call that thing and he surrounds himself with this light this power of this light and as he holds up that staff and he's surrounded by this light the darkness is just crushing and crushing and the ground beneath him is starting to crumble already and you can see on the expression on his face he's just holding on and we're wondering when is he going to actually crumble beneath the weight of that darkness that's pushing on him and is he going to make it is he going to get crushed and that's that's where he's kind of left Ha ha! And I think to myself, praise God. And you might be thinking to yourself, why, what, Kevin, what can you be so excited about in a scene that's clearly meant to describe that darkness is overtaking light? And I've got some verses we're going to read here because this is just awesome. You and I can rejoice in the face of heaviness because of the promises of God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. And you will notice that I've got both of these verses highlighted in yellow. I would like you to join me in reading these verses in your living rooms here, and we're going to go through them here. 1 John 4, verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen. John 16, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. Someone give a hallelujah. I know you're, you're just in front of your families. Come on, humor me. Like you're, you're only going to look bad in front of a few people. All right? Say a hallelujah here. Look at this. We should not be surprised when heaviness comes upon us. Jesus even promised. He said, in the world you will have tribulation. You will have. He told us that. Amen. But here's a question. If God has promised that he has overcome, if he has promised that he is with us, and that he is in us, and that he is greater than what's in the world, then the question that still, I think, sometimes lingers in our minds is why, if Jesus has conquered all these things, why is this heaviness so powerful in my life? Why do I sometimes feel like it still just crushes me, even though there is a promise from God that he is with me and has overcome that heaviness. 
And I want to do, a, a, as quickly as I can, I'm going to recap some scriptures that most of which will be very familiar to us, but I want to remind us of some things that are realities in our world today that we still face. And we're going to start all the way back in Genesis. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to 17 says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God's promise was that if we ate of that tree, we would die. And it would bring spiritual death. And there's another verse in Romans 8 that talks about how even creation has been affected. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope... The creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Trouble in our world, we need to remind ourselves of this truth, uh, my friends. Trouble is not necessarily caused by God. Allowed, yes, it is allowed, but it is not primarily often caused by God. I want us to be clear that the trouble that is in the world was not designed by God. It is brought by the choice that we made to sin and go against His Word. And it troubles me greatly when I hear comments along the lines where I can tell that there are undertones of offense and bitterness and even anger toward the Lord because He has not delivered us from certain things that we face. And I think to myself, what we need to remember is if we look at this whole thing from the picture of God, through the eyes of God, I can imagine, what we need to remember is that all of the mess that is around us was not because of Him, but because of us. And if you and I receive in our lives the salvation of God and the promise of eternal life, if that was the only good thing that God was going to give us for the rest of our lives, that would already be far more than we deserve. We need to understand that the problems and trouble and hardships in this world are because of sin entering the world. And that was because of our disobedience to the Lord. But there is a promise that God gave of redemption very shortly after the fall. We see it in Genesis chapter 3. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Amen. Notice the capital letter on seed. Capital letters indicate a person, a place, or a, uh, I don't remember, sorry. (laughs) My English teacher is going to be really embarrassed. I don't remember all the capitals, but anyway, sorry about that. But a seed I know for sure can refer to a person. And that person, that scripture is already talking about the plan that God already had to send His Son and redeem us and crush the enemy. And I love the way this is worded. Worded because look at this. Jesus shall bruise Satan's head and Satan shall bruise his heel. And I want to ask you, which one is more important for life? Your heel or your head? Amen. Hey, Jesus is going to completely defeat Satan. And we see that we're going to jump right on ahead into the, into the New Testament now. Jesus is standing uh, on trial in Luke chapter 22. And notice what he says. This is incredible. This, this really struck me. Jesus is saying when he's been arrested, why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there every day. But this is your moment. The time when the power of darkness reigns. That is coming from the mouth of Almighty God. In flesh. He is saying the power of darkness reigns. I find that astonishing. But, he, but even Jesus was subjected in obedience to the Father to the effect of darkness in this world. And one thing that really struck me as I was doing my devotions recently was when Jesus was standing before Pilate. Pilate was asking him about different things as we all, we're all familiar with the story. And one of the things that Jesus said that really, really struck me in a new way was when he's standing before Pilate he says to him do you not think that I could ask for all these angels to come and rescue me from this trial but I can't ask my father for that 
Because then His will would not be accomplished. And even Jesus is recognizing, this is just a little snapshot of what's coming here, even Jesus is recognizing that He cannot speak a word that is against God's will. or it would ha- He can't even utter the word. He can't even say, Lord, come help me, because then it would have happened, and He would have been rescued, but the will of the Lord would not have been accomplished. That's the power of the word of Jesus. And yet even in that place, He recognizes the power of darkness is reigning. And we as believers know what happened next. Matthew 28. So now Jesus dies. And He rises from death. And then He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus says, after He has died and risen from death, all authority in heaven has been given to Him. And so now we're thinking, ha I got Jesus' authority, I got Jesus' promise of His presence, now everything will be good. Right? Suffering, sickness, pain, discouragement, etc. is history. Right? Wrong. Revelation 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. My friends, what chapter in the Bible are we reading from here? This is Revelation 21. This is the second last chapter in the Bible. We are at the end of days when John is seeing through the Holy Spirit's revelation that all of this stuff will be, will be gone. The time for, for the effects of sin and death and decay to be completely eradicated from the world are not yet here. But they're coming. The time's just not yet. In the meantime, there is some things we have to deal with. First John, chapter 2. Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the last hour has come. First John 4.3 But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world, and indeed is already here. When is John writing these words? He is writing these words nearly 2,000 years ago, and what do I want us to see in this is lately in the news, we've heard a lot about, a lot of specifically conspiracy theories, and Delan touched on that a little bit last Sunday. We've heard a lot of conspiracies, specifically with the vaccine and the mark of the beast and all these things. What I, guys, the spirit of Antichrist, maybe the person of Antichrist has not come yet, but the spirit of Antichrist has already been at work for 2,000 years in the world today. He's been around. And that is what we are dealing with. We are dealing in our present time since the, and and John even says the last days begun in his day. Back in the New Testament when he's on the island of Patmos and, and exiled, the last days he refers to have already come. And that's what we've been living in since then. We've, we've been living in a world where the spirit of Antichrist has been around and alive and active, by the way. And so in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, We've got this little passage here that, that, that refers to some of these things. It says, now, now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to, be too, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I, when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. 
For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. What, what we, I don't want to get into a big theological debate. I have my opinions about what these, this scripture means. But what I really want to focus on here is that God's sovereignty is still clearly at work. And nothing escapes his watchful eye. We can see that the power of God that is restraining evil and restraining the Antichrist from fully being revealed is still, in pl- is still at work, is still in position in, in our world today because the Antichrist has not been revealed yet. So we know that God's sovereignty is at work. And at the same time, we know that it is going to get gradually and progressively worse As time goes on, as these last days continue, it is going to get much worse. Matthew 24. I'm going to come back to 2 Thessalonians in a little bit here, but we want to read this first. Matthew 24, 4-8. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. See the words of Jesus here? He even says, See that you are not troubled. I'm telling you that these things are coming. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. There we go. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines. Pestilences! How about that? Jesus knew about COVID like 2,000 years ago. Amen. Look at that. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. And all these are the beginnings of sorrows. Literally, sorrows means the beginning of birth pangs. And many of us in this church are parents, and, uh, and we've been in the hospital when we're delivering children, and I always thought it was kind of amusing when I was sitting there next to Denise. Not that I found Denise's situation amusing, but you could always kind of tell when the, when the, in the maternity ward, when the ladies around you, when it was getting bad, then it started getting loud in there. You guys know what I'm talking about. When it started getting bad, then it's, the volume went up because there was pain. And that's what Jesus is saying is going to happen. As time progresses, things are going to get worse. It's not getting better till Jesus comes back and makes all things right, but that time is not yet. Till then, it's getting worse. And Jesus has warned us about that. So back to 2 Thessalonians here. <clears throat> Chapter 2, verse 3, there was that specific reference to a great falling away that that Paul talks about. And what does that falling away refer to? Well, the next verses in Matthew 24 tell us what that means. Jesus tells us what this means. Then he says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Jesus foretells that lawlessness is going to abound in those last days. And that lawlessness abounding in society that we can start to see in our world and we have seen for a while, but it seems like it's just getting exponentially worse in the last number of years. But he says that's coming. And because of that, the love of many will grow cold. And I know that I've referenced this before, but I've got to say it again. The word love there, the Greek word for love, is a reference to the word agape, which specifically refers to the love of God. So we can see what Jesus is actually saying here is that those of my followers who, are part, who have experienced the love of God, those are going to be the ones, many of them, that will grow cold in those last days. That is a frightening thought. But Jesus foretells that that is going to happen. In Mark chapter 4, we see the parable of the seed or the soil or the sower, depending on how your version, uh, your version of your Bible translates that, and there's, there's clearly two types of seed germinating that end up falling away. And Jesus gives the reasons for that. I, I, I'm not going to go through that, but I'd encourage you to read that later if you want to. Mark chapter 4, verses 1 to 20. And it references, and he gives the reason for why some of that seed that has received the Word of God ends up becoming unfruitful and choked out and dead. 
And primarily it's because people don't have root, they're not going deep into Christ, and because they get distracted by the things of the world. And we see that all around us as well. So the question I want to ask then is how, how is this possible? How, how does this great falling away happen because of lawlessness will abound? How does that process happen? And I, I know that's probably tough to completely encapsulate, but I'm going, to, I'm going to give it a little bit of a shot. I remember, to illustrate, I remember working and growing up on a number of different farms, and I always enjoyed it. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about working on the farm and working for a few farms as I was growing up is I loved the challenge of making things work with not much to work with. Anybody experienced that before? Sometimes you've got a problem in the farm, and I'm looking at this problem, and, and I worked with pigs, and that's enough said right there. You know that all kinds of problems come when you work with pigs. And I'm looking at this problem, and I'm thinking to myself, I've got like, I've got like three to self-topping screws, and I've got a little strip of metal, and I've got some plastic. Now, how am I going to fix this drinker that's leaking? And you're sitting there, and all of a sudden, you get these ideas. And I, and I, I love the challenge of doing that. I love the challenge of trying to get things to work with, with what I had. And, and I didn't, I almost, it, see, it seemed at least like I never had really what I wanted, but I had to make it work with what I had. And, and that scene, some of you are familiar even with that scene from Apollo 13, a movie, the Tom Hanks movie from many, many years ago. But these guys are trapped in this rocket and things are going bad. And they assign this team and they basically just dump this load of stuff on the table and they say, this is what those astronauts have. You got to make something that's going to produce oxygen or that or these guys are going to die. That, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. We, got, we sometimes face these situations where we maybe don't have the perfect thing, but we've got to make use of what we have. Friends, Satan works the same way. You realize that? He uses what's available to him to accomplish one purpose. 1 Peter 5 and John 10. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I'm sure hoping that, by the way, the key leaders group for the way you guys said that verse with me by memory. Because we've learned it. You should know that one. That's a short one. John 10, verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. That is the work of the devil in our world today. That is his only aim. He is prowling around looking for people to steal, kill, and destroy. And I was recently meditating on this a little bit and thinking about this, and a thought that I felt was from the Holy Spirit really, really hit me hard. And it was this. At times, I have, I have some, we sometimes look at the, the persecuted church, we're, we're, we've called them many times the persevering church, and we've looked at how Satan seems to be just working through government to make life incredibly hard and almost impossible in many, many parts of the world. And and we feel, we should feel so blessed that we do not live in those parts of the world. That should be something that we should be thanking God for regularly. But it seems like we, we sometimes, sometimes I wonder, how do those people survive? Like, how do they keep going for Jesus when we hear about some of the things that they endure? It's incredible the, the amount of heartache and pain and torture and and. And whatever, just it, what those people, what our friends, our brothers and sisters in the Lord go through around the world. And, and it just sometimes amazes me how the power of the Lord keeps them going in, in, the, in the face of such horrible circumstances. And, and so Satan is clearly using the, the means of persecution to try to destroy the church in those parts of the world. But... What's interesting, what, what hit me, is that that method of, of trying to destroy the world is not available here in our nation, praise the Lord. He can't, Satan can't use that yet. Maybe that's coming yet, I don't know. But for now, that option is not available to him. And so he's going to use what is available to him to try to accomplish that goal of stealing, killing, and destroying. And what, what hit me so hard was that when I look around us, what do I see that seems to be really bringing Christians down and lose their focus on Jesus? It is exactly what we face in our day-to-day. -day. The comfort, the apathy that results because of the comfort that we live in, where we don't depend on the Lord the way we should. Laziness that comes from that. The discouragement, depression, self-pity for things that maybe aren't going the way I want them to go. Political unrest, and the list goes on and on. And I sometimes thought to myself, this thought hit me. 
If we viewed our current situation through spiritual eyes that see it as an attempt by Satan to cause ineffectiveness that would lead to a falling away from Jesus, would we take it more seriously? Would we take more seriously the situation that has presented itself, the heaviness that's on our society? Would we take those things more seriously if we understood it to be an attempt of the enemy to steal kill and destroy. Things like motivation to stay plugged in in church and with friends, fellow believers, a zeal to worship God even in your homes, turning on worship music. When is the last time that's happened in your homes? When's the last time you've just simply taken time to put a song on or something, gather your family and praise and sing a song? I feel the conviction of the Lord in my own heart because we don't do that often enough. Developing relationship with God a desire to encourage fellow believers, a passion to share the gospel with unbelievers around us and make new disciples. Friends, are we falling asleep? Matthew 25 verse 5 talks about people that are going to fall asleep as the bridegroom is delayed from coming. And I wonder if we viewed the heaviness and the different things that are coming from that as an attempt of Satan to steal, kill, and destroy, to to try to bring us to a place of unfruitfulness and ineffectiveness, would we take it more seriously? I have to believe for my own life and for all of us that the answer to that is yes. So then, that leads me to the second part of this message. And that is the solution. So we've talked about the heaviness. We've got to talk about the solution. Amen? Can't just leave it at, at the heaviness. That'd be terrible. What can we do? How can we prevent ourselves from becoming those who fall away or fall asleep? And we can do many things. We can, do, we can be part of prayer groups. We can go to Bible study and cell groups. We can take the way, which is so exciting. We got that under, underway in our church, and I'm really looking forward to that journey that we're on. We can call and text or email friends and church members regularly to encourage them. We can listen to worship music like I already mentioned. But there's one thing that I really want to focus on this morning that I think can be a difference maker in your situation. And that is, we've got to start speaking life. We've got to start speaking life. What do I mean by that? Some of us have already got red flags flying. They're waving in the wind already. Like, Woo, we got all oh, this word of faith movement. Yada. Hang on. Just let me explain where I'm going with that. Okay? We've got to start speaking life into our situations, all right? Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, I'm going to start with, and then verse 3. Jesus is saying this in in the synagogue later on in the New Testament, and he is revealing himself to be the fulfillment of this passage of Scripture. And Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 61 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, verse 3, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and... The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Hallelujah. That they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Jesus has come to give us a garment of praise to exchange that for the spirit of heaviness. Praise is fundamentally defined by verbalizing through word or song our recognition of the magnificence of God. And that is key, my friends, because many of us confuse praise and worship a little bit sometimes. Worship is an attitude of the heart. Worship can be done in many different forms, and no words are necessary to worship the Lord. But to praise the Lord, we must be verbalizing our recognition of who He is. It needs to be spoken out of our mouths. In Proverbs 18, verse 21, Proverbs says, Death and... Life are in the power of the tongue. Let's say that again. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who eat it will eat its fruit. Now some of us are asking, what makes our tongues so powerful? Why is this power attached to our words so significantly? Because they have the capacity to speak the very words of God Almighty who dwells within us. Amen? I'll help you. Amen. Because our tongues have the capacity to speak the very words of God Almighty who dwells within us. 
John chapter 14, verse 16 to 17 says this, And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Helper, and that He may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him. For He dwells with you and will be in you. He dwells with you and will be in you. Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, it sh- but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. This is why the power of the word of the Lord, this is why Jesus, when he was standing before Pilate, he could not utter the words to ask God for help. Because he knew that if he would speak and say, angels, come help me, it would not maybe be done. It would be done. Because the word of the Lord cannot proceed and not come back bearing the fruit for which it was sent. And the word of the Lord in your mouth through the Holy Spirit has the power of God. It has the power of God. And when God speaks, things come to pass. Whatever God says, that comes to pass. In Genesis 1, God spoke and all creation sprang into existence. In the book of Mark alone, Jesus spoke and cast out demons, cleansed lepers, healed the paralytic, sent demons into a herd of 2,000 pigs and killed them all. And every hog farmer said, Amen. He, he raised the dead multiple times. He fed 5,000 plus people. He calmed the storm and the list could go on and on and on. When Jesus was in the garden and the soldiers came to arrest him, and they said, where is Jesus? And Jesus simply said, I am he. And just at the word, the soldiers fell down before Jesus. They had no choice. The power of the word of God is boundless in the mouths of those who speak it. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 17, it says this, he is, the inv- he is the image of the invisible God. Just talking about Jesus. The firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, and who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, And upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. All things created in the world even today for all of time and past and whatever will come in the future. All things are upheld simply by the word of his power. And God spoke back there in creation, and he just simply said, let there be, fill in the blank, and it it had no choice but to spring up the way God said it. And it had no choice when God said, let trees continue to bear fruit according to their seed, and let animals continue to produce after their own kind. The word of God is still working today because of what he spoke so long ago. Because the word it, it, it works. It has to work when God speaks it. What God speaks must come to be. And in Revelation 19, 11 to 21, we see this amazing picture. This is one of, my, one of my favorite passages that illustrate the incredible power of God's Word, His spoken Word. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word 
of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Ooh, that's us. I love it. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. See that? Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. The Bible refers to the word of God as the sword of the Spirit. Out of his word goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both great and small, small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies, gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Look at how it ends here. And, with, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. My friends, I, I cannot think, uh, th this is going to be such a good day. I can just imagine, when we're following Jesus, he's riding his horse, and we're all following in behind him, and we see this vast army that's before us, and I sometimes wonder what we're going to think in that very moment. Have you ever thought about that? And as we look at this vast army, I just can't wait for the moment when Jesus is just simply going to speak. Whoosh, done. Battle over. Isn't that a, we, there will be no fight. There will be no war. Jesus will speak, and the war is over. Hallelujah. I love it. So back to Proverbs 18, verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Your tongue. Your tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. My friends, I do not want us to miss that Proverbs 18 also mentions that death is in the tongue as well as life. My friends, we must be very careful what we speak out. And I have heard various comments about how things are nowadays, and comments against the government. I have heard comments about how even initiatives in churches are not going to work. And I wonder, do we ever stop to think about what we are saying, and more specifically, what we are accomplishing by our words? If I say to an idea that we want to have in the church, oh, that'll never work. What am I saying? Or more specifically, what am I accomplishing by what I'm saying. I am speaking death and failure over something that may have been designed by the Lord to succeed. But if I speak life over things by agreeing with the will of God, they will succeed. They must. And so I want to challenge us. Be aware of what you are speaking. And this is very, very real in our time, specifically now since Friday, when we found out that we still cannot meet and I was as disappointed as all of you were as well. I was really looking forward to hearing that they were starting to relax the, the, relax the restrictions. And it's just really too bad that I didn't pursue my hockey career, because if I was a Winnipeg Jet, then at least I could be free now. But the reality is I'm not a good enough hockey player to play with, that, with them. And so we're still stuck in lockdown. And I was extremely disappointed. But my friends, we cannot give in to the temptation to start speaking negatively over the things that are. Rather, we've got to look at the things that we are we're still trying to do in the name of Jesus, specifically even in our church. I'll bring it right home here to our church. Things like prayer groups, things like the way, things like those. None of us prefer to, to, to meet on Zoom. But that's just what we have to work with right now. So why don't we start speaking life over those things and say, thank you, God, that this is going to work. This is going to reach people. This is going to set people free. This is going to see people saved. Rather than, uh, it, it, I don't know if it'll work. 
or even harboring those attitudes in our hearts. The word in your tongue, in my tongue, is powerful to accomplish the work of Jesus. John chapter 14. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. There is a clear, we could go into the Scriptures, we don't have time today, but there is a clear instruction of Scripture that if we are going to ask, we must ask in accordance with the will of God. We must ask believing what God has said in His Word. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is a good place to start searching our hearts to find out the motives for what we are praying to be accomplished. Do what we seek the Lord on, is that going to accomplish the furthering of his kingdom or will it not? Is it just for my selfish purposes or is it not? I just want to close with this, with this verse from Hebrews. And this also struck me as I was thinking about this. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 has been a verse, probably maybe the most quoted verse since March when some of the lockdown stuff started to happen. And there has been much controversy over how to interpret and live out this verse. But I want to challenge us with this. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. It seems to me that there is an imbalance with how we're looking at this verse. We are so focused on the beginning of verse 25, which says not giving up meeting together, and that's where our minds are being driven to, that, we're, that some of us are missing the rest of those two verses. Why don't we focus more on what we actually still can do to work and accomplish those verses? Why don't we work towards spurring one another on in love and good deeds and encouraging one another and by the way, we actually can still meet together through some of the technologies that are available to us, praise the Lord. So rather than moping about what we can't do or what maybe we are focused on what has been taken away, can I encourage us to start doing the things we can? And in so doing, we are going to be speaking the word of life into people's lives, and that word is exactly that. It is life. And it will bring healing and encouragement, and joy to people because it is the word of the Lord. So in closing, I want to say this. If you find yourself facing heaviness in your life, remember that this heaviness is not greater than he who lives within us. Amen? Yes, defeating heaviness and discouragement, that will take effort. But recognize that these tactics Desi these are tactics designed by our enemy Satan to try to defeat you and steal away your faith and your life. Treat them such. Treat them like such. Say, when I'm tempted to feel sorry for myself, when I'm tempted to feel down, ah, that's the work of Satan. I rebuke that in Jesus' name. And start singing a song. Start praying for yourself that the life will re refill you in a fresh way. Don't give in to thought patterns that would have you believe there's no hope. Remember that all the tactics of the enemy, not some, but all, can be defeated with the confession of our mouths and by speaking out the word of God into the face of our adversary. Nothing, nothing gives me more pleasure than to speak the word of the Lord and know that the devil's running. Ha! Amen, eh? I'm going to send that guy running more often. Be strong and stand firm and speak life as we shine brightly for Jesus in this dark world. I want to leave you with this. What you and I need to realize more than anything else is that in our state of heaviness and when we feel down, what we do not primarily need is for the restrictions to be lifted. What we primarily need is to realize that in that place, you and I have access to the source of life in Jesus. And what we need to actually start realizing is that in any moment of any day, we have access to the throne room of God Almighty because of the blood of Jesus. And in that moment, we can dwell in the presence of God by, by trusting Him to come, by speaking the word of life over our lives. And in so doing, we have defeated the powers of darkness and heaviness and all the things that bring us down. So I want to encourage you, 
If you have found yourself in that place lately, start speaking the Word of God into your life, over your life, over your family. Not for new quads and holidays and restrictions to be lifted primarily, but speak the Word of life over you and experience God where you are and in so doing gain life. Join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you that more than anything else, it, what we need is not even correct to say, it's who we need. And I pray, Lord, that in the moments of heaviness and discouragement and depression and anxiety that many of us are facing every day, God, in Jesus' name, I want to come against those things and cancel those assignments against the people of our church specifically, but anyone else who may be listening. And in Jesus' name, I want to rebuke those thoughts and those feelings and invite, Holy Spirit, your power to fill every person who hears my voice in this moment with a fresh life and a fresh encouragement and a fresh joy. And I want to pray, Lord, that in this next week even, if we are feeling in a place where we are beginning to feel down, I want to pray that you would remind us to start speaking and praying life over us and inviting you to meet us, because that is what we really need to seek your face. Lord, I pray, in all practical ways, please help us as we wrestle with the restrictions that are on us, and, and many of us disagree with them. I pray, God, that in all things, we would respect and honor those whom you have placed over us, and that it would not be found to be on our mouths slander and, and words against those who are in authority over us, but help us to honor you in our hearts. And please give us practical direction, Lord, to know what that looks like in living out our lives. God, I thank you so much that in you is the power to overcome. And I thank you, Jesus, for promising that you will never leave us nor forsake us. For we ask this and glorify you, Jesus, in your name. Amen.